A 911 call puts first responders face to face with an infestation. And then we take a look at the conspiracy iceberg theory that North Korea isn't some backwater communist dictatorship, that it's not a country where the people are slowly being starved. No. North Korea is a utopia, a glimmering technological marvel that no other country would dare to go to war with. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. We have a jam-packed episode. A lot of stuff to get to. But first off, I want to do this. This episode's coming out May 1st. And I want to issue you guys a challenge. Episode 300, I said, by episode 600, I want all of my listeners and myself to be in a different place than we were when episode 300 came out. That was my challenge to you. That's a long-range challenge. It's a long-range goal, and sometimes you have to have little goals in the middle of that. I hope you guys are doing that. Some of you guys... I didn't listen to episode 300. I didn't know we were going to get challenged. I didn't know you were going to be walking in my house and shaking me by the collars. Do it! And I might do that, but not now. Not I don't have the capability. Someday, though, I will be kicking down your door and motivating you. Right now, this is the Dead Rabbit Radio Initiative. Six weeks to a better you. May 1st to June 15th. I want you to be a better person by June 15th. This isn't some sort of subscribe to my email. I'm not asking for money. This is just for you and me. I'm doing it, too. I'm going to hit the fitness really hard. Long-time listeners know I was 350 pounds two years ago. I'm 275 today, and I've kind of always been around 275 for the past year. I've had a hard time dipping below that. So these next six weeks, I'm really going to focus on getting below that. That is my goal. That is my fitness goal, and I know I can do it if I focus on it for six weeks. Maybe you want to start a webcomic. Maybe you want to write a book. It's time to stop doing the character designs. It's time to stop the world building. Let's put pen to paper. Six weeks. Maybe you have a hobby you've always wanted to start. That might be hard during the coronavirus. I always wanted to fly kites. Okay. It's not a perfect time to do this. But if there's an instrument you want to play, something like that, let's do this now. Pick up that dusty guitar in the corner or that dusty marionette doll. Let's do this. Six weeks to a better you. Six weeks from now, I want emails and YouTube comments, Instagram comments, Twitter responses, whatever, tweets, whatever they're called. I want them coming from you telling me that you are in a better place. That's what I want. I want to, I, I'm doing it. I want you guys to do it. And let's say you're listening to this episode. You're like, dude, it's December 2022. I'm listening to this episode way in the future, June 15th. Six weeks from the day you listen to this episode, I want you in a better place. Because you can do it. You can do it. People, you can listen to my old episode, Behind the Scenes episode I did. And I talk about my journey from just walking down the street one day to starting this podcast. This podcast changed my life. One day. One day I made that decision. Six weeks to a better you. Six weeks to a better me. Six weeks to a better all of us. Let's do it, guys. Let's go ahead and get started with our first story. And actually, even before I do that, and I don't like having these long preambles, I gotta give a shout out. I give Patreon shout outs all the time. I got to give a shout out to someone who's supporting the show in her own way, Sabine. Sabine, thank you so much. For you guys who don't know, Sabine has been incredibly helpful during this pandemic. She's a really good friend of mine. She's She was uh, buying me groceries. I was giving her the money. I'm not a freeloader, but she was picking up groceries for me. She's driven me around town. She's totally taken care of me. So I want to give her the keys to the Carpenter Copter today. Technically, she is a real-life Carpenter Copter. Whenever I need a ride somewhere, she's more than happy to take me to the grocery store. I'm kind of thinking she has a crush on me at this point. But I want to give the keys to the Carpenter Copter. She is going to be our vehicle. Technically, again, she is the Carpenter Copter. So imagine for today's episode, it's the normal Carpenter Copter, but with like a big smiley face on it and cartoon eyeballs like Thomas the Tank Engine. That's Sabine's spirit infusing this metal monstrosity that we've flown all over the world and through alternate dimensions. So f- go ahead and fire up that Carpenter Copter, Sabine. You know, you, your anthropomorphic, so the key just turns automatically. Let's climb inside of her. We are flying out to Pasadena, California. Now, this story takes place on Doomsday, and it's so funny how people... Apparently now, August 16th, 17th, and 18th is supposed to be the end of the world. I don't know if you guys have heard that. 
I really haven't. Re- You're like, no, Jason, I haven't because I don't hang out with lunatics like you do. Apparently, that's the new Doomsday thing. August 16th through 18th, uh, three days of darkness and blah, 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 blah. These dates always get moved. Remember just a couple months ago? The Palodrome Day, February 20th, 2020. It was only going to happen like once every 10,000 years, dude. And it's like totally impossible, man. Remember that? That was supposed to be a big day of awakening. You're like, Jason, we are in the middle of a pandemic. So maybe something happened on that day. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Here's the cycle. Make a prediction. Nothing happens. Then you go, oh, no, no, no. I was just saying it was going to start then. That's always the thing. But anyway, so August 16th through 18th is supposed to be the end of the world. I mean, if there's any more information about that, I mean, like, obviously, if the world starts ending, I'll probably report on it, but it's just, again, some lunatic theory. But this has really nothing to do with that. February 20th, 2020 is an actual day, though, that this event happened. Let's go ahead and land the Carpenter Copter in the middle of Pasadena, California. And as we're flying over, we intercept the 911 call, which I'm sure is illegal. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, oh man, I got ah, I got stung by a bee. Uh, I'm on the corner of this street and some other street. Ah, uh, uh, a bee sting. And the 911 operator's like, "Were you? Are you like allergic? No, just I'm stung. Oh." So, anyways, the 911 operator's probably like, oh, I'm kind of being a big baby about it." But let's send out some first responders. So, woo, woo. That's the fire engine. That's an old-timey police car, car 54. That was an old reference. They're driving down the road. Turn the corner. Fire engine turns the corner. Now, here's the thing. I'm reading this story, and the story makes it sound like that's what happened. A guy just called up 911 and says, Oh, I got stung. Because the police and the firefighters were not expecting. Like, they literally turn a corner into this. If the 911 call was like, help, help, then they probably would have shown up a little better prepared, but they didn't. Fire engine turns the corner, police car turns the corner, 40,000 Africanized bees flying everywhere. So again, like if you got a call, if you got a call from a loved one being like, I got stung by a bee, will you come and help me? You would be like, oh, oh, what a big crybaby. Again, unless your loved one is allergic to bees, then you're like over there in heartbeat. But if you drove over there into, you're driving and you see like a brick wall of nothing but bees. And then they form a fist and they're like punching your car. And then they form a bow and arrow and shoot an arrow of bees at your, you would be a little upset. (laughs) They didn't tell you about the cartoon bees there, right? You would at least, and if they did tell you, hey, watch out, because I'm pretty sure these bees can form any shape possible, you'd be prepared for that, right? You'd bring, like, a giant net or a water hose, which I guess the firefighters brought a water hose, and they probably have giant nets. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that these first responders drove into the middle of 40,000 bees and got overwhelmed. Ah! Shots fired! Shooting at the bees. The bees form a bulletproof vest. The bullets are bouncing off. Ah! Firefighters, ah. So anyways, they had to run for cover too. Now, you're like, Jason, I'm sure the guy who called 911 didn't go, help, I'm stung, as 39,999 other bees are flying around. The guy 911's like, should I tell him about? Nah, I'm not going to tell him about those. He probably said, look out, there's 40,000 bees. And they didn't know how to deal with them. They just went out there anyways. But the point is, is that the cops were quickly overwhelmed The firefighters were quickly overwhelmed. They had to shut down a city block. The bees form Godzilla. They're stepping through the city. Eventually, though, the firefighters called a professional beekeeper. This is where the story gets interesting. Not that beekeeping is is interesting in and of itself, but this is where the story gets interesting. Firefighters call a professional beekeeper. Hmm? Keep, keep that. Hmm. You're like, Jason, why are you making suspicious noises? about? about hold on. Hold on. Firefighters call a professional beekeeper in, right? And they go, what we're going to do, it was on the roof of a Hampton Inn. So basically, like, you go, you check in, you're like, yay, we're on vacation. Open the door to your bathroom, a bunch of bees come out. Ah! Um, and they're like, well, you, you, you were vacationing from Africa. You're like, oh man, if I never seen Africanized killer bee again, I'll be totally fine. Now I'm just going to turn on my shower. Ah. There was 40, 
40,000 bees on the roof of this hotel, which must have been horrible for their cable reception. You're trying to watch shows. They're all hanging out on the dish, hanging out on the satellite dish, getting a suntan. How did they not know? <laughs> At what point did it go from a thousand killer bees to 40,000? And maintenance never knew. They're like, dude, you're checking the roof, right? Yeah, yeah, I check the roof every day. They're, at what point? Like, it's not overnight. It's not just 40,000 bees showed up there. Anyways, they had this giant nest. The firefighters had to get a big old ladder, which luckily they have. It's a four-story hotel. And the beekeeper walks up. Now, they're spraying it with CO2 and foam extinguishers. And the bees are like, uh, getting all disoriented and stuff. Now... There's, which, here, that's pretty ballsy, right? <laughs> You'd be like, we need to get rid of 40,000 bees. Let's go smash their house. Let's go attack their house, right? It's like Clindathu all over again. They're going in there. They're spraying the hive with foam. Now, I love the, the last two lines of this article are just absolutely great. Because just the imagery involved. Second to last line is, some of the bees were killed. I think that's an understatement. I'm sure a lot of them are getting... Ah, get off of me! They probably killed maybe a thousand just by stepping on them. Some of the bees were killed while others left the area when the sun went down. Isn't that, like, romantic? Like, the sun... You're like, Jason, I'm allergic to bees! Nothing's romantic! But imagine, like, the sun is slowly dipping below the horizon. You just see bees kind of flying off. Credits roll. I think that's kind of romantic. I mean, again, if you're not allergic to, if you're not in the middle of 40,000 bees, if you are in the middle of 40,000 bees, them flying away during sunset is the biggest relief you've ever had, which is kind of romantic. Then the last sentence. Okay. So this beehive just magically appeared on this rooftop. And you're like, Jason, you really don't know how bee <laughs> beehives are made if you use the word magically. 40,000 bees suspiciously appear in the middle of downtown Pasadena on this roof of this hotel. And they swarm out, and a bunch of people are getting stung. They shut down a city block. Here's the last sentence of this article. And this article is from CNN.com. It's in the show notes. Quote, the beekeeper... Mm, mm, he's back. This, 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 this dude. The beekeeper safely removed the hive so that the bees could not return home. Unquote. They're like, what? what? How is that suspicious? Now, we're standing on the roof. We're standing on the roof. Carpenter Copter is parked behind us. Sun's setting. We're watching bees fly away. And you go, Jason, that's fine, but why are you making hmm, hmm, noises every time you talk about the beekeeper? Here's my conspiracy theory. And allegedly, so don't sue me, beekeeper or beekeeping industry. What if... The beekeeper takes the hive, safely removes the hive. He doesn't smash it with a hammer. Safely removes the hive so the bees cannot return home. What if somewhere underneath the city of Pasadena, there's a beekeeper? And he's walking around in his beekeeping suit, right? And he has, like, Indiana Jones storage boxes. <laughs> Not boxes full of Indiana Jones. But remember in Raiders of the Lost Ark when they had all those boxes at the end? He has hives, a bunch of, bunch of beehives, right? And he takes beehives. How could 40,000 bees appear on a roof? He takes beehives under the cover of darkness when all the bees are away because they're flying into the sunset. And he installs beehives around, right? And then he leaves. He puts them in places where he knows janitors won't look. So basically, your hotel room. He leaves, and then he just sits at home and waits. Not home. He sits in his underground lair that I've created and waits for a phone call. Oh, no, watch out, a bunch of bees coming. He's like, I'll help you for $10,000. <laughs> Jason, Jason, you, you, this professional beekeeper, you've made up that he's some sort of supervillain. True, I have done that. I have done that, and I may get sued by the Beekeepers Association of America, which would, oh, dude, Beekeepers Association of America, BOA, like Cobra, this might go deeper than I thought, this might go deeper than the underground catacombs of Pasadena, it's a perfect money-making scheme, right, you just put bees everywhere, and then you put out the bees, and you don't smash the hive, he safely removed it, so he can keep it for his next adventure. 
And then he takes his beekeeping helmet off and he's a giant bee. What if he's just a bunch of bees in a suit? And he's like, I'm sorry, some of us died in our last our last money-making adventure. And the other bees are like, Why? You're you're made of bees in a suit. Why do you need why do you have to blackmail the city of Pasadena for money? And he's like, Revenge. Anyways, <laughs> that's the story. That article is literally like four paragraphs along. And I read it and I thought, the beekeeper, I mean, the first time I read it, I go, the beekeeper did it. This is a beekeeper conspiracy. Because really, how much money does a beekeeper make? Like, how much honey can you sell in a week to afford, to afford a box full of wax? And you need farmland or, or passages under the city. Okay, I think I've spent enough time on my beekeeper conspiracy. And I'm sure you guys all agree. Let's hop, let's go to the story you guys are all here for. Let's hop back in the carpenter copter. Sabine, fire yourself up. We are headed out to North Korea. Now this, and I should have said this way earlier, because you guys are probably looking at the cover art for this episode and being like, what in the world is going on? What does any of this artwork have to do with bees? The artwork you're looking at was created by John from Scar Group. He's the guy who did the cool, like, pencil Dead Rabbit logo that we see. It's like the profile shot. We use that. That's one of our alternating artwork. This was one he came up with when he was listening to our Lake Mon- our Heaven Lake North Korea episode. You'll see Kim Jong-un as a lake monster and his father, uh, Kim Jong-il, as the son. I- it's really, he said he just sketched it out. I really like that picture. So, thank you so much for that, John. Also, got to give a heads up for to Stealthy Steve. He was the one who recommended, in his own way, the North Korean week in the beginning. It was just a conversation we were having. Started it off. I also want to give a shout out to YouTube user 99900 all week. He was like, dude, do North Korea is a utopia. And eventually had to tell him, shut up, dude. That's Friday's episode, man. He kept calling, hey, man, when are you going to do this one? You should do this one. And finally, I was like, shh. Dude, you're giving it away. And he's like, oh, okay. But I wanted to give him a shout out because it is recommending an episode. Even though it was planned, that's still totally fine. And and then a last shout out for this story goes to Ori. Ori actually recommended the Space Force. Um, is Space Force being built to fight alien story? Part of his conspiracy theory actually involved North Korea and in a way something similar to what I'm about to talk about. I didn't discuss it in the episode for time. I didn't think it was super important for the narrative the other part of the narrative but i wanted to give him a shout out too because that also put a little nugget in my head to take another look at north korea so ori 99900 stealthy steve thank you guys so much for uh, making this all happen it's been a lot of fun let's talk about this conspiracy theory this episode is going to run a little long i probably could have could have cut out some of that b stuff but this one's one of those ones that i really want to go into now on the conspiracy theory iceberg one of the old ones on there is North Korea is secretly a utopia. The, one of the earliest references I could find predating the conspiracy theory iceberg was a Reddit post for writing prompts. One of the writing prompts, was, and this was like in 2017, uh, North Korea is secretly a utopia. And then we started to see it pop up on the conspiracy theory iceberg. It had predated it by a couple months. So let me say this right now. I'm going to do this super early. We're going to put on our conspiracy caps. I think it's fairly easy to debunk this. So I can just say it's probably just um, put on the conspiracy theory iceberg because someone thought the writing prompt was interesting. It's something that people have thought about anyways. It's probably not true. But that being said, let's actually put on our conspiracy caps and let's look at this as if it was true because I found some interesting coincidences some interesting coincidences so being take that carpenter copter nice and low over the north korean forest we are back in the year 1945 and this beginning is going to be a little historical jumping around stuff so i hope you don't get sick as we go through time portals here japan ruled korea and then after 1945 they got kicked out the soviet union takes over the north now what's interesting is there's a lot of again when i talk about coincidences there's a lot of weird stuff going on North Korea is taken over by the communists, and America is like, "Uh uh-oh, we don't want them to have this whole peninsula. At this point, China's not communist, but we still, we're dividing things up. And so America asks Soviet Union, hey, can we split that down the middle? And oddly enough, the Soviet Union said, yeah, sure. 
We didn't even have sizable troops in South Korea at the time. It's not like we went up to the 38th parallel and said, no more. That type of stuff happened in Berlin. But here we asked. The Soviet Union divided a country up with us. It's almost like they didn't want to govern it by themselves. It's almost like they couldn't govern it by themselves. 38th parallel is divided up, separates North and South Korea. June 25th, 1950. (laughs) War breaks out. North Korea, backed by the Soviet Union and China, invade South Korea, backed by the United Nations. The U.S. was the main fighting force, but it was United Nations' effort to control South Korea. The war is quick and brutal. You have North Korea push almost all the way down to Seoul, South Korea. And then the war pushes almost all the way up to Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. June 25th, 1950, the war begins. The war ends three years later. July 27th, 1953. And when the war ends, basically it goes back to the 38th parallel. And it doesn't even end. Right now there's a ceasefire. It's like a 40, 50 year ceasefire. So no one was ever declared a victor. There was no one suing for peace. The war is still on. They're just not shooting. There's never been any official documents as far as that goes. The war is technically still on. 1962, North Korea declares the all This is a mouthful. The all-fortressization of North Korea. They basically turned the country of North Korea into a bunker. Hyper-militarized is the term for them. 1963, North Korea goes to the Soviet Union and says, Hey, you know how you want to do that whole thing with the nukes and Cuban Missile Crisis and all that stuff? And, you know, no one knew what was going to happen. We were all going to wake up tomorrow in an atomic heap. Soviet Union's like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're quite aware of that. It had happened in 1962, 1963. Korea goes, you know what would be dope? If you gave us some nuclear weapons because we got American... No. What? Like, no, you got uh, Japan here. That's American controlled. You got uh, South Korea. That's a ton of... No. No nukes. What? North Korea's like, okay, that's kind of (laughs) weird. You're ready to give them to Cuba. We're closer to you. We've actually fought in a war with you. Well, I'll ask our neighbor China. Hey, China, can we get some... Nope. Oh, you didn't even let me finish my sentence. Yeah, but Soviet Union called called before you came over and said, dude, he's going to ask if he can borrow some nukes. Don't give him any. And that's weird. That's really weird because of the huge... Co- and you could say it's because the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Soviet Union... The Cuban Missile Crisis was an issue because it was so close to America that if missiles were launched from Cuba, we'd have no early warning system. Soviet Union had nukes all throughout the Soviet Union. China had nukes. North Korea is an ally of both, spilt blood with both these countries. Why wouldn't they give them nuclear technology? And this is where I'm going to start throwing out suppositions and things like that. Is it because they felt a nuclear North Korea was too much of a threat, not just to the West, but to everybody? Well, yeah, Jason, the leaders in North Korea are so crazy. If that was the case, why don't they do a regime? And that actually is a good lead into our next thing. They won't give them nukes. And you go, well, maybe they're too crazy because the Kim family, why hasn't there been, if that's true, if that's true. And Soviet Union doesn't want to give them nukes. China doesn't want to give them nukes. They've been spending this whole time trying to get nuclear technology, nuclear missiles. Why don't they do a regime change over there? I mean, America would love to do a regime change over there. It's called South Korea winning the war and then everything is just governed by South Korea. But how come Soviet Union's never went in and taken out Kim and put someone in there that they would trust with nuclear weapons? Or China. China has a lot of problems with North Korea. Their big fear is that if North Korea fails, you're going to have millions of starving people pour over their border. You have North Korea, we talked about it yesterday, distributing drugs over the North Korean border, buying chemical, the precursor chemicals to make the drugs from China, And then being like, oh, thanks for giving us those chemicals. Here's the finished drugs and causing drug problems in China. And also makes China look bad because they're a rogue state. Whenever America's like, America, they'll tell North Korea to knock it off. And then they go to China and say, can you get North Korea to knock it off? And China, their answer generally is, we'll try. Like recently, they stopped buying coal. I think they're doing it again. But a couple of years ago, they had to stop buying coal from North Korea to get them in line with the international community. They make... 
North Korea is your crazy neighbor whose house is painted pink in a perfectly beige subdivision. And people don't feel comfortable going to the pink house, so they go to the pink house's neighbors, which would be so Union in China. And they're like, dude, we're trying, man. But that guy's nuts over there. He's playing ACDC all night long. Pretty sure he's on meth most of the time. So why hasn't China or the Soviet Union, they're not around anymore, but when they were around, why didn't they take out the Kim family? North Korea has the second largest supply of an element called magnesite, or mineral called magnesite. Magnesite, while not a super rare, it definitely has uses. And they have the second largest supply of it. They are the 18th largest producer of iron and zinc and has the 22nd largest coal reserves in the world. And you're like, well, why aren't you doing podcasts about the other 21 coal reserves? Well, here's the thing. The other 21 coal reserves have been claimed by other empires. And then you have this little tiny hermit kingdom that's sitting on all of this stuff. Massive supplies of fluorite, copper, salt, lead, tungsten, graphite, gold. And on top of all of those natural supplies, massive lumber industry. Like I said, China buys their coal from North Korea. They have a massive amount of it. Up to $6 trillion of rare earth metals. That cell phone in your pocket can only be built with rare earth metals. China has invested billions of dollars into Africa for their rare earth metals. And yet North Korea is just sitting on them. It's one of those things. You can go across the street to borrow a cup of sugar, or you can drive to the store and buy a bag of sugar. Why is China investing so much into Africa, where some people are afraid that China is actually going to conquer Africa economically? It's going to be a recolonization of Africa. Why are they doing that when literally across the street, there's a lake full of monsters separating China and North Korea? Six trillion dollars worth of rare metals, not including the metals that I listed. Those are all not rare metals. There's just stuff you want. You want lead. You want tungsten. Why aren't people trying to take this country over? But Jason, we did. It was, you know, the the 38th parallel that you talked about the Korean War and all that stuff. Here's the thing. They invaded the South. It was a pushback against that. But even then, the war ended in 1953. We didn't know how valuable rare earth metals were back then. I don't even know if we really knew what they were. I'm sure geologists knew what they were, but... We didn't have salt. We didn't need them. And now there's $6 trillion of it sitting in that country. Why hasn't America finished the job? Why hasn't China put in a China-friendly, business-friendly leader? Take out the Kims, move in. Or the Soviet Union do that back then. Now, it's interesting because all this week I've been talking about how the Kim family of North Korea has been trying to tie themselves to the old kingdoms, the old ways that they are the bloodline They are the true rulers of true Korea. Let's take a look at the founding of North Korea. There was a guy, this creation myth, basically, a guy named Hwang, which means supreme divine regent. He lived in the sky, but he loved humans. So he got permission from whoever is above the supreme divine regent to come to Earth, but not alone. He brought 3,000 of his people, they come down to Korea. That origin story kind of stands out, doesn't it? We have have stories of the world being created. Biblical stories, stories, religion. That's not what this is. This story of Hawaii, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. I can almost bet money that I am. Isn't the story of the beginning of the world. It's the story of the beginning of Korea. Humans were already established. Things were already going on. But someone from the sky came down with 3,000 other of his kind to inhabit Korea. That sounds less like a creation myth, how were humans formed, and more like alien visitation. It's interesting that we have a number. It's interesting that it's someone who's already existing in a world full of humans and they're looking at seeing how much they love humans. Totally doesn't deal with... The creation of the world doesn't deal with how humans evolved or how they were created or anything like that. Everything's going on and 6,000 years ago. Because this story isn't Korea. They can say it was founded in this year. 6,000 years ago, this wasn't super ancient. 
they come down from the sky to live in Korea. A place of beauty, of riches, nestled in between empires. And ends up becoming an empire itself. But, you know, empires will fall apart as time goes on. Legends will be lost. Ruins will fall apart. Japan eventually invades Korea. And then it gets divided up. Soviet Union comes into North Korea after World War II. And they start to hear whispers from the population. Local leaders are telling the Soviets things that both intrigue them and scare them. Stories of long-lost technology. In a world where the rocket is the most advanced piece of weaponry, could the North Koreans have been telling the Soviets things that their country's founders had brought to Earth? And so when the United States says, hey, do you need help dividing up this country? Do you need help governing this? The Soviet Union says yes. Every other place that was divided up between the West and the East, was hotly contested. Soviet Union welcomed the U.S. presence in South Korea. Could they contain what was actually there themselves? As North Korea is beginning to form, and you have this leadership that claims to be related to the empires of old, they start to wrap their fingers around the levers of power. Soviet Union, China get a little nervous. And when North Korea decides to invade the South to reunify their country, Soviet Union and China does fight alongside them. And the war, which really should have been, I mean, it came so close to ending twice. When everything got pushed all the way down to the south, and then everything gets pushed all the way back up to the north. And then a defeat, a retreat back to the 38th parallel, back to the line where it started. Even though each country pushed so far in, no gains were made. Why would the U.S. back down? Why would we go, yeah, let's just go to that original thing after all that money and all those lives lost. And the Korean War is often referred to as the Forgotten War. It's just been brushed aside. It's not as sexy as World War II or not as gritty as Vietnam. But is that the reason why it's just been brushed aside? It's what we've always been told, right? So Jason, are you trying, are you telling us that because of these weird coincidences that maybe North Korea has access to some sort of UFO technology. I'm not telling you that because of those coincidences. I'm telling you that because of this coincidence. UFOs were all the rage in 1952. That was really the year that UFOs took off. <laughs> no pun intended. Roswell happened in the 40s, but if you a lot of people don't know that Roswell did not become a well-known event until the 70s. Nobody talked about Roswell. There was the newspaper article, and it just kind of disappeared. It wasn't until the 70s when books about UFOlogy started being published was when Roswell... Contemporary UFO enthusiasts, like especially in the 50s, which is closer in the 70s when I say contemporary, Roswell was nothing. They didn't even know about it. It wasn't until the 70s when that came out. 1952, though, was the year of the UFO. That was the year Project Blue Book got started. So people were talking about UFOs. The media was dismissing it as little green men, but UFO sightings were at an all-time high. Korean War is in full swing, by the way. July 12th, 1952. UFOs seen over Washington, D.C. It's called the Invasion of Washington. There's been a lot of documentation of this. Sightings all over the place. From July 12th to July 19th, we were seeing these UFOs in the sky. They were showing up on radar. You had pilots, both civilian and military, identifying these things. At one point, we launched two fighter jets to chase these UFOs. They disappear from radar. The jets start to go low on fuel. They land. They appear back on radar. And that's when the military goes, whatever these things are, they are actually able to monitor our radio transmissions. So this goes on from July 12th to July 19th, 1952. Then it disappears for a few days. July 26th, July 27th, the UFOs reappear. Fighters are scrambled again. And the official report is weather problems. It's making the radars go off and people are seeing these things. It was no big deal. But this frustrated the CIA so much, they started what's called the Robertson Panel in 1953. Because of this Washington, D.C. flap. Frustrated them so much. And the Robertson Panel... Basically, the CIA wanted to know what was going on with UFOs at this point, and they had two directives. One, our fear is that UFOs aren't real, 
but other governments will fake a UFO invasion to overwhelm our early warning systems, and then they'll be dropping tons of troops in our area. Their second directive was they went to Project Blue Book, and they said, you guys need to shut up. You guys are only allowed to talk about UFO stories that you have dismissed. I don't want to hear you guys talking about stuff you can't identify. Project Blue Book is only allowed to talk to the media about UFO stories that they have 100% debunked. Change the course of Project Blue Book. July 27th, 1952. One year to the day. One year to the day. July 27th, 1953. America, Soviet Union, China, North Korea, South Korea, call a ceasefire to the Korean War. The guns fall silent over the Korean Peninsula. Here's my theory. Again, conspiracy hat firmly on head. UFOs that we're seeing are coming from Korea, specifically North Korea. The country was founded in part by alien visitors. And the early expansion of Korea into China, this powerful empire, stories of the romance of the three kingdoms, these early warlords slash emperors who conquered the peninsula and parts of Asia, were powered by alien tech. But over years, that technology becomes stories, that technology becomes legends. Some of it breaks down, some of it is lost. So by the time Japan invades Korea, it's just a steamroll. But as the Soviet Union moves into Korea, this technology is rediscovered. These stories about the Kim family trying to connect themselves to the old kings may be that the Kim family has found the old king's weaponry. Now, if you came across the UFO in 1910, you wouldn't know what to do with it. It just looks like a big dome. But by the time things are industrialized, you do know what to do with it. You can replicate it. You can go in and go, this is a control panel. K-Man doesn't know what a control panel is. Clear button press. They don't even know what press is or what button is. But by 1950, they know what these things are. A lot of people say that the UFO sighting started because we started, modern UFO sighting started because we started dropping nukes. You know what else was going on after the end of World War II? The ascendancy of North Korea. A country that was supposedly founded by people from the sky now are becoming more powerful and at the same time Flying discs and UFOs are being seen all over the world. That's always been the big question with the military is, are these from another planet or are these from Earth? Because if they are from Earth, they are 10 times more dangerous because that means an unknown government or unknowing organization is flying them. Beep, bop, boop, aliens flying from planet Gleep Glorp. That's weird, but we don't know what their motives will be. North Korea, we know what their motives will be. North Korea has access to these UFOs. Soviet Union knows they can't contain these people on their own. America comes in. North Korea invades South Korea. Am I saying they use UFOs during the the Korean War? Not likely, because I think this is where we go with this, is that the goal is to not only have access to this technology, but to not widely reveal it. However, the UFO flap over Washington, D.C. may have been a warning shot from the Korean government. This is our level of technology. We disappear off radar years before stealth. We can be anywhere, anytime we want. I think you need to come to the negotiation table. I think you need to call a ceasefire. Because at that point, North Korea wasn't doing very well in the war. And you go, Jason, 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 you 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 put your hand on my shoulder. You're like, I, you take off my conspiracy theory cap. Didn't you just say earlier this week that they're like selling meth because they don't have enough money for food and all this stuff? Well, here's the thing. If you had access to this technology, would you want the world to know you have access to this technology? Sure, you'd want the other governments to know to leave you alone. And maybe every so often you talk about like shooting a nuke or, oh no, my people are starving. Aren't you guys starving while everyone over there is well fed? The illusion is the illusion. The illusion that it's this starving country that's super behind is actually the illusion. When really it is a completely peaceful utopia where everyone's needs are met where no one goes hungry, where no one is afraid, where everyone knows what the future will be because the future is now. While you have 7 billion other people surrounding you, sick, 
and dying and hungry involved in strife and war and chaos, would you want the world to know that you were a utopia? China's worried about North Korean refugees coming over. You would have all of the people of the world trying to get into that sci-fi wonderland. So if that's true, why don't other countries of the world expose North Korea? Say, hey, we're dying of these horrible diseases, but they have this alien technology. They have these cures. Because then you're admitting you're technologically inferior. To, not only are you technologically inferior to another country, you've lied about it for years and years and years and years and years. It's possible. I mean, here's the thing. Is this conspiracy... Let's take off the... I'm taking, willingly taking off the conspiracy hat at this point. Is this conspiracy theory possible? I mean, sure, anything's possible, right? So while the rest of the world sits and wonders what happens next, whether it be, will another war break out anytime soon? When's the next pandemic? How is our economy going to survive? The Hermit Kingdom may have all the answers, and they're hiding them from us. North Korea may have the technology. They may have advanced weaponry. They may have cures to all known diseases brought to them by their alien forefathers. But more importantly, they have the will to hide it, to let the world think they're a fourth-rate country. Starving, destitute. Because sometimes when you have the power, you can't show it. Because if you're better than everyone else, everyone else is going to do everything to tear you down. And it's not that you're worried about being defeated. Your worry is that you have the ability to unleash hell on the rest of the planet. But you don't want to do that. You just hope that someday they can find one sliver of your utopia that you've so expertly hidden from the rest of the world. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend. I love you guys. Be safe. Six weeks to a better you. Remember that. I'll see you Monday.